seated and turn with me in God's Word to Genesis chapter 33. We've been going through this series now for a while, starting to be kind of uninterrupted, uninterrupted for a while. I'll probably still turn back sometimes to Luke and that. Uh, I don't want to burn you out, but I, I, again, I'm pushing towards Joseph particularly. Uh, I'm eager to, to look at God's Word together in, in that section of Genesis. Uh, Genesis really forms the foundation for everything we understand in the rest of the New Te- or Old Testament as well as the New Testament because it's pointing to Christ. It's pointing to your and my need before the Lord and how that need can only be met in Jesus Christ. And so we have glimpses of, of God's grace ultimately looking forward to Jesus Christ. We have glimpses of what we're called and, and commanded to do even through the example of other very imperfect believers. And so let's look at that now in chapter 33. And uh, we're looking at the whole chapter here. Now Jacob lifted his eyes and looked, and there Esau was coming. And with him were 400 men. So he divided the children among Leah, Rachel, and two maidservants. And he put the maidservants and their children in front, Leah and her children behind, and Rachel and Joseph last. And then he crossed over before them. And bowed himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. But Esau ran to meet him and embraced him, fell on his neck and kissed him, and they wept. And he lifted his eyes and saw the women and children and said, Who are these with you? So he said, The children whom God has graciously given your servant. Then the maidservants came near, and they and their children bowed down. And Leah also came near with her children, and they bowed down. Afterwards, Joseph and Rachel came near, and they bowed down. Then Esau said, What do you mean by all this company which I met? And he said, These are to find favor in the sight of my Lord. But Esau said, I have enough, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. And Jacob said, No, please. If I have now found favor in your sight, then receive My present from my hand, inasmuch as I have seen your face, as though I had seen the face of God, and you were pleased with me. Please take my blessing that is brought to you, because God has dealt graciously with me, and because I have enough. So he urged him, and he took it. Then Esau said, Let us take our journey, let us go, and I will go before you. Jacob said to him, My Lord knows that the children are weak. And the flocks and the herd which are nursing are with me. And if the men should drive them hard one day, all the flock will die. Please let my Lord go ahead before your servant. And I will lead on slowly at a pace which the livestock that go before me and the children are able to endure until I come to my Lord and see her. And Esau said, Now let me leave with you some of the people who are with me. But he said, What need is there? Let me find favor in the sight of my Lord. So Esau returned that day on his way to Seir, and Jacob journeyed to Succoth, built himself a house, and made booze for his livestock. Therefore, the name of the place is called Succoth. Then Jacob came safely to the city of Shechem, which is the land of Canaan, when he came from Padam Aram, and he pitched his tent before the city, and he brought, bought the parcel of land where he had pitched his tent from the children of Hamor, Shechem's father, for 100 pieces of money. Then he erected an altar there and called it El Elohi Israel. May God bless the reading of his word. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands firm. Well, brothers and sisters in Christ, this is probably one of the great high points in the life of Jacob. But it's also a glimpse of a very common theme that will repeat itself throughout the scripture, of of the power that the gospel of God's grace brings through reconciliation. Of the people of God with others. You think about it, here we have this God. who to us, a holy God, who to us, as undeserving as we are, reconciles us as sinners to himself, ultimately through the death of his perfect, righteous son, Jesus Christ, through all, who, to whom all the sacrifices ultimately point to. And this undeserved gift demands that we seek reconciliation between us and others, especially as Christians, in our families, in the church, 
and even with others in the world with whom our relationships are strained. Who are you struggling with today? Who is it that you just don't like? And maybe for good reason. God teaches we're not to look at them the way the world does. In fact, Jesus in John 13, uh, 35, which we read earlier, describes it this way. By this all will know that you are my disciples if you have a love for one another. And that love is to reflect his undeserved love towards us. This means the mark of the Christian. Uh, the gospel which take, takes root in our heart is how we love one another as Christians. You see, the world isn't going to be impressed. I mean, it's good that we do this. We're called to do this. It's a command. But it's not going to be impressed by us going to church and putting the Lord first in our week, in schedule. It's not going to be impressed by us wearing Christian t-shirts or the pictures in our homes with the you know, beautiful scripture passage underneath. They're not bad things. But the world may never see any of that. Francis Schaeffer, one of the men associated with the seminary, I went to explain John 13, 35 this way. And he says it in a point, pointed way. This is a frightful thing, is it not? Jesus turns to the world and says, you have the right to judge Christians on the basis of the way they love others. Is there somebody you need to reconcile with that you need to show the love of Christ to? I would say it's always humbling for me to preach these sermons. Because I can think of some people Is there somebody that's wronged you? Is there somebody that, that, that you've wronged? Maybe you've just gotten tired of holding out that hand, that loving hand to them. Or, or maybe bitterness or even pride has, has kept you from that in the first place. And, and the beautiful example of Jacob here that God shows in his word is one of the most difficult demands of uh, this reconciliation. It's the most difficult demands of the Christian life. And yet God's undeserving grace demands we humbly seek reconciliation and that we be humble, you and I be humble at how we look at ourselves and our imperfections and as well as how we look at others too. Scattered throughout this beautiful account are, are these two points that I'm going to be making and, and I believe God is is teaching us here too. God's grace demands we humbly seek reconciliation. Verse 1 tells us, Now Jacob lifted up his eyes, and look, there was Esau coming with him, 400 men. Here's Jacob. He's returning to the promised land, determined to meet with his brother, whom he had long ago sinned against. And he literally... He doesn't turn tail and run back across the river. It's tempting thing to do. He literally does what Jesus will later command of us, which we talked about a couple weeks ago even, in Matthew 5, 24, though this time. If you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there and before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come offer your gift. That's what Jacob does here, isn't it? And Jacob is pursuing this reconciliation after a sleepless night, after he definitely did not feel the best. He, was wrestling. he had been wrestling in hand-to-hand -hand combat with the Son of God, during which time the Lord took Jacob, who was this sneaky supplanter, grabbing what he could, and transformed, himself, transformed him into Israel, the one who wrestles with God and prevails, really, by his grace. He, and he forces on Jacob by this permanent injury of a limb, to, to force Jacob to give up on his own strength and pride in order that he would live the life of faith. Now, it kind of should make us think about the things that make us so weak in this world. 
We should look at it differently when we think about them as being in God's sovereign hand. But Jacob was forced to give up on his own pride, his own strength, and rest on God's power and blessing. Exhausted, battered, and bruised, he cautiously divides up his family, as verse 2 tells us, and he's no longer a coward all behind them, but, but he's now going in front of them, limping towards that approaching dust cloud of this army. Here's the one who tricked his brother when he was weak, who deceived his father in his weakness to get the blessing. And verse 3 tells us now, he bowed himself to the ground seven times until he came near his brother. Jacob, who once grabbed his brother's heel, now gives him the greeting that is fit for a king. This is not trying to butter him up. This is uh, ancient archaeology shows this was a common blessing given to kings. And then verse 3, rather than Esau falling on Jacob, on, onto Jacob with a sword, we see Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him, and they wept. How many tears of reconciliation and joy and peace have we lost because we have not sought reconciliation? And these here, these tears were, were no doubt tears of joy as well as regret for the years lost because of past sin. In fact, remember how God addresses us about the issues of life. Ephesians 4 says, Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. This means we can't let months and in years go by in bitterness and self-pity, feeling anger and justifying our silence and separation. When we allow such brokenness and alienation to enter our marriages, our families, the church, or even those in the world, Satan wins. Satan rejoices when we choose to live with hatred towards others, and we need to repent of this. So God gets the glory. I know reconciliation is costly because it will cost our pride. It may even cost us financially. Because when we stole something which did not belong to us. Think of Zacchaeus when, when the Savior came to him. You know, we sing that little kid, you know, Zacchaeus was a little wee little man. We sang that at PBS this past year too. Which seems like months ago, it was months ago. And, and Zacchaeus, when the Lord was coming to his house in response to the Lord's saving grace, Zacchaeus, a tax collector, a pos a position, by the way, that was notorious for overcharging, for stealing from others, said very imperfectly, <laughs> didn't really want to admit it. Look, Lord, and then, and then he eventually says, if I have taken, he talks about giving his, his wealth to the poor, and then he says, if I have taken anything, a portion of his wealth, I should say, if I have taken anything from, the, from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. The law demanded. God demanded that. In the Old Testament law. And how does Jacob show his repentance? When Jacob asks, who are these with you? Jacob says, the children whom God has graciously given your servant. He, he's declaring himself as the undeserved, undeservedly blessed by God and as a servant of his brother. But didn't he have the promise that the older shall serve the younger? Yeah. God calls us to, to take the lead by serving, even as he served us. Go down to verse 8. Esau asks him then, what do you mean by all this company which I met? To which Jacob replies, these are to find favor in the sight of my Lord. And then we hear the shocking words from a pagan, no less. I have enough. Jacob even also says, I have enough, right? When's the last commercial 
came on the TV and said, don't you really have an out? Well, we live in a time of greed, discontent. I have enough, brother. Keep what you have here for yourself. We simply struggle to say this. And we might think, well, you know, these pleasantries going back and forth between Joseph is kind of like when, you know, we go out to eat with friends and, and one friend says, well, you know, I'll take the bill. And the other friend says, no, no, you don't have to. And, and we'll just go Dutch and we'll split it up. And we just think it's part of politeness. Jacob, though, states, no, please, if I have found favor in your sight, then receive uh, this present from my hand. Jacob is very imperfectly saying, his point really is, let me pay you back for what I took. Let me apply this point more here for us. Because as Christians, we know we have the New Testament before us as well. And we are called to forgive. We're, we're called to seek reconciliation. Not looking at that person that has offended us so much or whom we have offended. But conscious of the one that's paid the price. Who took hell. The judgment of hell. To reconcile you and I to the holy God we have offended by our sin. In fact, never forget that you and I have always, always offended God more than anyone could ever offend us. And so how can we accept His forgiveness, God's forgiveness, and not give it to others, particularly week after week as we pray those words, forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. See, that's part of the ministry of reconciliation, which 2 Corinthians 5 calls the ministry of reconciliation. It's declaring the gospel of God, reconciling us to Christ, but it's also to visibly live out the gospel, that gospel truth in our life of God's undeserved forgiveness by making and seeking peace with others. In fact, we're told, as much as it depends on you, live at peace with others. It's not always possible. An amazing thing is, and this is the illustration we have here. The wonderful thing here is, is that while God does not save Esau, he does mercifully work in Esau's life to turn his murderous heart. Remember the last words he said, I'm going to kill you. And brothers may say that to each other. Or siblings may say that to each other. They really don't mean it. Esau did. And now he falls on his brother's neck and weeps and cries and embraces him. This is why Jacob said to Esau, uh, For therefore I have seen thy face, and though I had seen the face of God, and, and thou wast pleased with me. Jacob sees in Esau's loving embrace the grace and mercy and the work of God. Because God can change hearts as easily as we splash water about in the sink. That's what Proverbs 21 teaches us. Admittedly, our seeking reconciliation will not always go as well as this. But we need to push for it much more. We need to pray for it. So often we don't seek reconciliation because we don't pray for it. And we don't get it when we seek for it because we're not going before the Lord to do His work in our heart and the lives of others as well. That's why the missionary to inland China, Hudson Taylor, a reformed pastor who, who had to deal with very difficult people, he explained it this way. He says, I move men by God through prayer. You got somebody difficult to face him Monday morning, tomorrow? Maybe later today? Pray. Or as Matthew Henry said, it's not vain to trust in God and call on him in the day of trouble that those who do so often find the issue much better than they feared. God is able to soften not only our hearts on the salvation, but also to soften just generally the hearts of others. And so we've got to pray. Now lastly, and, and more briefly, God's grace demands humility in dealing with our and others' perfections, imperfections. 
In all this, Jacob cannot be proud. Because of this inborn nature, he had the same nature we will struggle with as well. Here's Jacob. He was born with a clasping, uh, with a clasping hand. And now he's openly confessing, as he does in verse 11, God hath dealt graciously with me. And yet here's the difficult reality of God's applying salvation in this life on this side of eternity. It doesn't mean that we will instantly and perfectly be transformed never to sin again. I wish that was true. <coughs> Jacob still sins. Verse 2, we saw it. He, he played favoritism. He was hoping if, if he saw his brother got mad, you know, at least he has to hack through the whole family to finally get to his favorite wife and his favorite son. And this will sow the seeds of bitterness later, as we'll see, among his sons. And then when Esau encourages him to, to come with him, Jacob rightly returns the opposite direction to the promised land. In part, Jacob understood and was obeying what's made clear to us in 2 Corinthians 6.14. Uh, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? It doesn't mean we remove ourselves from the world, but we've got to understand uh, we don't marry an unbeliever. We, we don't sit there and make our best friends the, the world's people. We don't get influenced by the world. Well, what does Jacob do? He, he doesn't say, you know, brother, I'm sorry, we've got to part ways here. He lies about the reason he won't go with Esau. And part of that's true because he's been on this 300-mile breakneck journey to get away from Laban. And he has a command to return to the promised land and actually return to Bethel, really. There's an inference to that in chapter 28. But even there, he stops 20 miles short short a Bethel, which is going to lead to other problems. Jacob is not fully sanctified. Jacob's a sinner, even like us. Now think of John Newton. Wonderful hymn we just sang not too long ago. You know, John Newton was a slave trader. He actually even captained his own ship which is shipping slaves from the Muslim traders and even from some of the African tribes as well who are se selling their enemies. And when he became a Christian, we would like to think that he stopped. Do you realize he actually wrote some Christian hymns? Not Amazing Grace, but he wrote other Christian hymns actually while he was a captain of the ship trading slaves. It took a while for him to repent of more and more of his sins. And we're going to be wrestling with our own sinful nature and repentance, looking to Christ and relying on his strength. And, and that must humble us, seeing our imperfections. And we have no reason to pat ourselves on the back. And we cannot forget what our own confession says, that even the holiest men among us have only a small beginning of the obedient life God requires of us. And we're going to constantly prove that even our best works are as filthy rags. Yet El Elohi Israel, the God of Israel, still graciously blesses Jacob. Even accepting the sacrifice, which he makes, the sacrifice which ultimately points to Christ. And, and so one of the things we have to understand is we are not better than unbelievers. And yet God accepts our imperfect obedience because God looks to the righteousness of the Son given to us. And this has an application even in our reconciling with others. Because if God is graciously patient with us, if Jacob, who, is, who, who we are like, is in a constant relationship with God in need of reconciliation with God because of his sins, constant sins, and yet it's something he and we get despite our imperfections, it should change how we look at those around us. Think of this, even Jacob doesn't even say, forgive me for my sins. And understand, that's not an excuse for us to just buy gifts for our wife, wives when we have offended them and, and think, well, that, that should cover it. Or a gift to your husband, or whatever it is. No, we know much better. 
We're called to confess our sins to one another. Jacob made a very imperfect confession of sin to his pagan brother. And they reconciled. This means we can never say, I won't reconcile, I'll never speak to this other, because they didn't say all the right words. Because even the smallest display of repentance demands we forgive. For even our best prayers are imperfect before God and need his forgiveness. And yet he forgives us. The brothers and sisters in Christ, this beautiful scene demands we seek reconciliation with others because of God reconciling him us to himself. And here's this covenantal model really set before us that we're called to draw. And in fact, Christ even possibly refers to this in Luke 15 with the return of the prodigal son who, who what happens? The father uh, sees returning from afar off and we hear the repetition, the same thing. He, he runs to him, he falls on his neck and he weeps just as Esau did Jacob. And I know this pursuit of reconciliation is difficult. But the other thing we've got to remember, who's watching? Well, the world's watching. Our family's watching. Are they seeing God's grace at work in us? See, at the back of this procession was a very little boy who watched his dad and his uncle reconcile. And later, when his own brothers were standing before him, before Joseph, with the power of Pharaoh, in Genesis 15, his brothers expected for selling him into slavery and all that they abused him with, that he would kill them. But looking to God's sovereign grace, Joseph declared, and he even wept with him too. But as for you, you meant it evil against me, that God meant it for good in order to bring it about as to this day to save many people alive. And my prayer is today that God would not let us go untouched by his mercy. And that we would pursue and follow this model more and more. A model which made clear by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and his command even that we love, that we show our love before a watching world. <coughs> Maybe today that needs to be done with your spouse a family member, somebody here in this church <coughs> or in the world. <coughs> Don't look at that other person, but humbly look to God, whom we have sinned against far more than anyone can sin against us. And understand, pursuing reconciliation pleases God. That's why he even teaches us, behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. The God who in Christ reconciles us to himself calls us to this difficult task so that the world would see our Reconcile that love of God through us, reconcile ourselves to others, and that God would be praised. Let's pray. Almighty God, and most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that when we were sinners, you sought us out and you pursued us so, it would be, so we would be reconciled to you. We pray for the relationships in our homes, in this church, and even before this watching world. Remove the walls that exist in our lives, melt hearts, remove bitterness and hatred, restore relationships. Make us to love you as you have loved us. And we do that, not through you, the unseen God, but we see, do that ultimately through our brothers and sisters whom we see. As a congregation, Lord, make us to love reconciliation. Make your love be reflected in our lives, making us quick to restore, quick to forgive. Not letting the sun go down on our anger. Help us to follow you in this ministry of reconciliation. Because this is how we show our thankfulness to you for such a great salvation. And we pray, work this out in us. Through Jesus' name we pray. Amen.